Hi, this is Paul. This weekend on Michaela Peterson's channel, they released a video with Russell Brand between Jordan and Michaela and Russell Brand. Now, Russell Brand had a couple of the more interesting conversations with Jordan Peterson in the first wave, so I was really happy to see that this happened. It also, by the appearance of the video, seems to be an earlier video before Jordan was sort of doing his own thing again, because if you remember at first, he and Michaela, he sort of jumped on to Michaela's podcast. Those seem to be in January, maybe early February, before Jordan started doing his own thing. And so this seemed to have been uh, recorded and then held for the release of Russell Brand's book, which later in the video it says his book is being released in March. And they talked about March being so far away. Well, March is almost done now. We're at the end of the month of March. And so I imagine that this was recorded a while ago, but Peterson was in good shape. Um, Michaela, I thought this was actually a particularly touching and moving video. One of the things that really impressed me, it continued to impress me, because a lot of people have sort of been critical of Michaela, and I understand why, and some of her introductions to some of the podcasts in the first wave, but she's there. They showed in this video really a lovely, uh, uh, really a lovely relationship between them. And so it was so good to see that. And I even thought about just doing a short video about about just their relationship because it, it's really quite, I think, I, think, I think Jordan and Tammy should feel proud about the daughter that they raised because, yeah, would she have as big a podcast channel without her very famous father? No. But she, I think, is is doing a good job, and I think they should be proud of her. And it sounds like she's quite involved in Jordan's work, and it sounds like she's continuing to grow in that. You can't blame the young for being young. It just takes time to grow and learn and develop in this world. So I loved this conversation. I thought this was a tremendous conversation, and Russell Brand didn't disappoint. But before I'm going to do some commentary. It might be two or three videos actually on this because I thought there was so much good and important stuff in it. But before I get that, I wanted to share with something that I read in the book Reformations about the Radical Reformation because part of what the author Carlos Erie, I don't know if that's how he pronounces his last name, part of what he dealt with in that book were the spiritualists. And a lot of ways... That's where Russell Brand is. And some of the comments in the book about the spiritualists and the Radical Reformation, I thought, in some ways, seem to apply to Russell Brand. In one of my previous videos, I talked about, so you have Martin Luther and his reform, then you have the Swiss Reformation, and that's a little bit before John Calvin, which the book then goes into. And I might do a video on uh, Carlos Erie's treatment of Calvinism, because I thought that was quite good and quite helpful too. In fact, I'm, I'm very impressed by the whole book. But he did a significant section on the Radical Reformation, and he included a lot of people that, oh, their names come up now and then, but they're just sort of like free-floating radicals out there. They're not part of any movement. Now, you might say that Russell Brand is part of the uh, spiritual but not religious movement or the New Age movement, and okay, but that, to talk about them as part of the New Age movement and using the word movement there as opposed to any kind of institution is part of the point. They don't cohere, and if I were to do a longer video on that dynamic, I would get into the fact that someone like the Lutherans and then the Calvinists, they cohered. Uh, some elements of the Radical Reformation eventually cohered into the Mennonites and some of the Brethren, um, the Moravians, a whole bunch of different movements it, it eventually managed cohering. But part of what I liked about Carlos Erie's treatment of the Radical Reformation is that he also gave some attention to the fact that other elements could never sort of come together, but yet in their sort of being free radicals out there in solution, they eventually did have a fairly significant impact on the shaping of, of Western history. And so I just wanted to read this little section on the radical legacy. If historians were to pay attention only to movements that involve large numbers of people, 
the spiritualist and the entire Radical Reformation could easily be overlooked. In the case of the spiritualists, as with other radical groups or individuals, the number of adherents was always relatively small and so undetectable that any estimates that any estimates are, in fact, mere guesses. I, I think part of this goes into the conversation that I've been having about churches and platforms. And again, back to Ross Douthat's observation that Marianne Williamson, the would-be uh, presidential nominee for the Democratic Party who didn't get too far in the Democratic sweepstakes. In the 19th century, she would have founded a church because churches were platforms. Well, today, people, spiritualists, let's call them, like Russell Brand, are just using other platforms. And those platforms themselves are in many ways outstripping the church in terms of significance. I've made this observation with respect to the debate about women in church office, but it, it holds true too for these spiritualists. And part of the reason we're seeing spiritualists that are so visible today is again because of the difference in platforms. But radicals are significant beyond their numbers for three reasons. First, they offered an alternative form of religion in which communal bonds were redefined, and in doing so, they shaped not only their own identity, but also that of their opponents, who had to come to terms with them. I think that's really important for the spiritual but not religious people. I was watching that video about what's so bad about Christian movies, and from the sounds of it, the, the movie maker spoke as sort of a deconstructed Christian, a little bit upset with some of the in-group, out-group dynamics of churches. That's a legacy of the radicals. This, this, the, the, the thing that they pick up, that sort of this, this, Jesus managed to communicate a, a radical critique of in-group, out-group, which is easiest to maintain if you have no group. And in some ways, that has a lot to do with the creation of platforms and to be able to speak from platforms that are non-institutional or even anti-institutional. That's, that's an element of what we've got going today. So that, that's the first point. Second, they were the first Western Christians to break completely from the medieval symbiosis of church and state and to insist that church membership should never be compulsory. That won the day in the West, and churches continue to struggle with it. But again, this is an element of the Radical Reformation as opposed to the Magisterial Reformation. And in some ways, there's no Church of Russell Brand to join, but thousands Hundreds of thousands, millions of people read his books, listen to his podcast, and so in that sense, he is a spiritual leader without a platform, but there's no joining him. Maybe you support him on Patreon, maybe you buy his books, but there's no Church of Russell Brand. And this is part of this dislocation that I don't think the church has adequately come to grips with, nor is there any, of course, accountability. Russell Brand just simply speaks for himself. Now, part of what we're seeing with cancel culture is an attempt at accountability where there are no formal structures of accountability, especially in a place like the United States where, well, maybe you'll get canceled from Twitter or YouTube or Facebook, but the U.S. government really can't come after you. I was listening to an episode of The Verge cast where they were talking about uh, having, you know, the, the leaders of Twitter and Facebook and Google up on Capitol Hill. And part of at least what the Democrats sort of wanted to do, not the Republicans in this case, I mean, it tends to swing back and forth, is get these social media platforms to do what the U.S. government is not legally allowed to do because of the First Amendment. So there's a lot going on here. But in the case of someone like Russell Brand, he's, he's sort of a spiritualist. And, you know, certainly, well, some of the, some of the spiritualists, if you read Carlos, Carlos Erie, uh, were pretty radical as, as Russell Brand is. And, and we're going to, part of the reason I'm doing this as at least an anticipation of some commentary on his on his talk is that 
he is trying to be not confined to Christianity, but attempting to use spirituality as a dominant frame to avoid, or at least to somehow encompass pluralism. And, and that has been really the dominant move for a couple of three centuries now, maybe, to, to sort of say, well, there's there's spirit, there's there's the world of spirit. And this is in one might argue in some ways an attempt to go back to polytheism. But I'm going to have to really do a video looking at this quite a bit more because once you go back to polytheism, you tend to get into all the same issues that are brought up in ancient polytheism. So there's there's no easy way around that. But but if you sort of keep it fast and loose, you go there. But but that's sort of separate from let's say philosophy and science. And so there's a lot of dynamics going on there. Okay, I'll get to the third. Third, save for the Munsterites and other apocalyptic activists, the radicals tend to champion toleration and the right of every individual to choose his or her faith. These three contributions to Western culture, one might argue, are among the most significant made by anyone in the 16th century. And I think, I think Erie is very right by that, because in many ways, these... These influences have deeply permeated the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, I just saw Kale Zeldin and posted a tweet about some Roman Catholics are, you know, basically continuing to hit Bishop Barron on this. Because in many ways, this has sort of become table stakes in the contemporary public forum with respect to religion. You had better respect your religious adversaries and not try to uh, do violence against them, let's say, the kind of violence we saw in the 16th and you know 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. In some ways, the Radical Reformation won some of those days, but they didn't win it institutionally. They did basically influence and in some ways subvert old practices of institution to a degree that most of us listening to this would not want to go back to. Do we really want to see Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox going to physical war against each other? Even opposite ends of their spectrum seem eerily modern. Whether one looks at the Munsterites with their um, totalitarian nightmare, or the spiritualists with their solid, with their solitary quest for truth within themselves, and you can hear that in Russell Brand. It is fairly easy to see more than the dim reflection of our own day and age. And so I wanted to read that before we listen to Brand because Brand is going to come off differently to different people. For 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 some of us who are Christians, listening to Brand will be irritated at his free-floating spirituality, others will appreciate that free-flowing spirituality and see that as a way to address pluralism. Well, but brand is going to be brand. And I think in some ways in the tradition of the Radical Reformation. Now, again, I'm not saying he's a Mennonite or a Hutterite uh, because those eventually formed particular confessional traditions, as did much, most of the Radical Reformation. But I think, as this book notes, there are elements of it that had a tremendous amount of influence that in some ways, how to weigh, how to measure influence against each other. So you can look at Calvinist churches or Lutheran churches or the Roman Catholic Church or Orthodox churches and say, look, there they are. But yet many of these ideas and assumptions by those in the Radical Reformation infiltrate. And, and so what we have here with this conversation is we have, let me move some of the screens here. Um, we have Jordan Peterson, who is, you know, sort of wavering at this line with respect to Christianity. And we have Michaela, who seems... She's watching her parents go through this, but she seems kind of comfortable as a young secularist who might be, you know, because you can't be purely secular. There's a certain uh, cachet of cool that Russell Brand is promoting in terms of his his freeform pluralistic spirituality. I'm going to harvest from all camps. 
And Peterson, of course, who is sort of leaning into a more formal Christianity, but I think still basically keeping to one side of the line. And again, this conversation predates his conversation with Peugeot. Now, to set this up, they Russell Brand talked about the fact that he has two daughters, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and they're talking about the impact that parenting has. And Peterson had made rather a bold statement about how how parenting matures you and grows you up. And we'll pick up the conversation there. Duty, devotion, and perhaps if there is a sort of some transcendent component to your life, and I, I don't mean that in necessarily in a spiritual way, but uh, it's difficult to avoid the connotations of, of that word, then perhaps perhaps maturation is possible. If you take, for example, like a straightforward uh, uh, mendicant's life, monasticism, celibacy, devotion in a very uh, yeah. explicit way to God, then would you say that they are unable to, to reach maturity? Or what if it was a secular version, like devotion to the arts or to a sort of a political cause? Do you not think that that could... Well, well that, so of course... It, I now, now, this is... Because Brand is a comedian... I long ago learned very successful comedians are can be incredible observers of the contemporary frame. I saw that when I was watching movies often produced by comedians, someone like Steve Martin. Um, to be a comedian, you have to sort of at least have an intuitive sense a really good sense of where the zeitgeist is going because you're you're making these jokes that cross lines so you have to at least intuitively know where the lines are and and brand more than many now as he you know had a dramatic rise as a comedian had some dramatic falls um, in terms of substance abuse his romantic life i mean all i mean he's in many ways sort of been a clown he also has a very good sense of where a lot of these lines lie. And so Peterson has just made a pretty dramatic statement about how parenting, or at least parenting well, is a huge engine of maturation. Now, within there, there's a sense of, okay, you don't maturation towards what? Even using the word maturation has an implicit telos within it. There, there's at least a value structure that one is progressing from something towards something, and maturation, well, tends to be uh, a capacity for sacrifice, and they're going to get there, sacrifice, self-giving for the sake of the other, in this case, a biological child. And now with this question, what Russell Brand basically says is opening it up to other human beings. And and this sort of stalks a number of conversations like the one with Brett Weinstein when they often have this debate. Okay, well, it's in your evolutionary biological self-interest to run into the building burning to building burning building to save your child, but maybe not so to save your neighbor's or your enemy's child. And, and what Brand basically notes is that implicitly he is noting what I just said, that there is a degree of telos and a hierarchy with respect to maturation implicit in Peterson's claim here. And one might argue that, which is where they're going to go, that a good deal of this has to do with Christianity because, of course, at the center of Christianity is the symbol of a man with ultimate power, the Son of God, who surrenders his life for the sake of not only his disciples, but even his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they, This is Holy Week in the United States, or all over the world. Uh, the Orthodox Catholic, okay. Um the point is that Christianity embodies this in the Christ, in Jesus. That's the that's the story he walks out. That reminds me of something I wanted to talk to you about. I read your book, Mentors, which is this book right here. And um, 
one of the things that it made me think about was I've thought for a long while that the one of the processes that marks the transition from childhood to adulthood is apprenticeship. And so one of the things Nietzsche said about the Catholic Church was that the European mind, this is speaking in Nietzsche's voice, the European mind disciplined itself by adhering to a single interpretive strategy for centuries to explain everything under the conditions, un, to explain everything using the axioms of a single intellectual system. And that disciplined the European mind and enabled it then to go off and use other disciplinary strategies to discover other, to discover other ways of dealing with the world, maybe. Now, if you're like me and you've heard Peterson talk a lot, you've heard him make this point a fair amount. But one of the things that I have seen again and again is that Peterson will say things like this and I'll listen to it and I'll hear it. I might even be able to spit it back. But how capable am I to connect this to other things? This argument in some ways is, is that I don't I'm not in a position to evaluate whether Peterson has Nietzsche right on this or not. But it, it's sort of like saying that Catholicism in the West became a proto-science for European culture. That part of the reason we talk about frames and part of what science does is the world is too big for us to to manage. And so part of what we have to do is reduce things down to certain variables in order to sort of get a handle on the rest of the world. And this observation is that what European culture did was limit itself to this one perspective. And Peterson's argument is what that created in the culture was a certain discipline, a capacity to do this, which then European culture did it with respect to Catholicism, and one might argue, Peterson doesn't say this, but one might argue that in secularism, in empirical, rationalist secularism, European first does this in Catholicism and then sort of does this to secularism. And the scientific, of course, the scientific age is born out of that, the Industrial Revolution, all of these things are born out of that. And so that's actually a really interesting insight that I hadn't, I hadn't really thought through until I had heard this a number of times. To develop science, for example, and Nietzsche was very convinced that you had to enslave yourself in one manner or another before you could be free. And that's an apprenticeship motif. And to me, that's what you explored in your book, Mentors. You know, you, you present yourself, I believe, as someone who was striving in various ways to mature and that you identified people who came into your life as targets for emulation that could impose a discipline on you and help you mature. You would have hunger for that like, like people do. And yes, I do think that if you don't have children, there are other disciplinary strategies that you can use to further your maturation, but it isn't obvious to me that any of them are as profound as having children. And I mean, I've had a good career. And profound in the sense of, well, children are, unless you are going to abandon your children, either demonstrably in a, in a very physical way or do lots of little cheats, which parents also do, and much more of a corruption of, of your parenting responsibilities, which which probably all parents do to one degree or another. It's a, it's a vital point that Peterson makes. And I've, I've been very interested in intellectual pursuits as well, and I suppose have disciplined myself in some manner because of that, but I still stand by my um, statement about children. They're in a different category of, of profundity. It's partly because you have to take on so much responsibility when you have children. Is it the sacrifice too? I mean, if you think about people who, who work in churches or what, what Russell was saying about, you know, people who devote themselves to God and it's kind of what they do is kind of sacrificial. And I suppose part of what you do when you have kids is sacrifice that hedonistic part if you're going to be a good parent. So... And, and You'll hear this in my sermons some, at some point. And actually, in many ways, I get this illustration from Tim Keller that what happens in parenting 
get it from C.S. Lewis as well. That's probably where Tim Keller got it. We can read about it in The Grand Miracle in C.S. Lewis's chapter in his book Miracles. What happens is that every act of every mother brings a child into this world at the risk and sometimes at the cost of her life. Uh, you look at John Verveke's great clip on agape. Uh, you take this unformed little being and in a sort of Brett Weinsteinian way, you raise and you you bring that little being via parenting through the agopic sacrificial love of the parents into the human race. And as Peterson often says, if you don't do this, if you don't properly if you don't properly civilize your child, let's say, socialize would be what he would say. If you don't civilize and socialize your child by a certain age, that child will never get it. And so there's a window there that you have to hit. And that is astoundingly costly for parents. So costly, in fact, that we have, as part of the conversations we're having about the the marriage crisis, the the failure of the intergenerational handoff, a good number of people are simply opting out of it, at least in their 20s and 30s. And to a degree, Russell Brand is making the point that he got started late at this. And part of the reason it's a good thing that he got started late at it is because he would be terrible out of it in his 20s and 30s. But again, I think that points back to the culture because a healthy culture affords wisdom to individuals that they have not had time as individuals to accumulate themselves. And so in some ways, Russell Brand's story is a story of the failure and the loss of culture because he now, I don't know how old Russell Brand is, my guess would be he's in his 40s. Now Russell Brand is having to gain the wisdom that if he had been brought up in a different culture is wisdom that would have been present in him perhaps to get started on these issues in his 20s. But instead, he needed to use his 20s to gain wisdom, but the wisdom by trial and error, which is very costly for a being that might only live 60, 80, or 100 years, to lose two decades means to lose a quarter or a fifth of your life in gaining wisdom, which if it could have been imparted to you by a culture, that would have given you 20 more years. But now you have to do it later in life. So I, I think Michaela's point here is is dead on right with respect to sacrifice. And again, look at, it just so happened that I paused the video at this point. I'm so impressed in this video at how Michaela and Jordan talk to each other. And again, this is, I don't want to take anything away from Michaela in this, but this is to Jordan and Tammy's credit that they have raised a daughter like this. And again, people can, it's it's part of the sport of social media is to find fault. And I certainly have found plenty of fault and you can find me finding fault in my YouTube videos. But I think it's also important to pause and look at these individuals and say, hey, you know what? Are they a perfect family? No. Was Jordan Tammy perfect parents? No, there are no such things. But you know what? Things could have gone a whole lot worse, and I see a whole lot worse a lot of the time. And so I just want to pause and say, hey, well done, Jordan and Tammy. You did a good job with your daughter. She's able to play the game. She's in there. Is there room for improvement? Always. But, um, you know, I, I again, I was, I, was, I was impressed multiple times. So so Russell Brand has a heart out at some point, and then Jordan and, and Michaela keep talking. And I, I just found that, if I do a third segment of this video, I just found that to be just a beautiful conversation between a father and a daughter. I, 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 I thought it was just lovely. Anyway, back to the video. Is, is part of what helps you mature the sacrifice associated with having children, or is it something else? I don't know if that's part of what helps you mature or if that's a definition of maturation, is that it's a sacrificial act. But, you know, people... See, and that's where this telos of maturation... One of the videos I was thinking, I'll see if I have time this week to do it because it's a weird week for me. My wife's off work. I've got extra work to do. I usually try to 
give some more time to my wife in this week when she's off work and maybe do something special, but there's COVID, blah, 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 blah. Jesus Christ has so fundamentally reshaped the value hierarchies in the Western world that this notion of sacrifice has has nearly become the definition of maturity. That is a profound difference. And the irony, of course, that Jesus himself, to the best of our knowledge, did not marry and had no offspring. Often think of sacrifice in terms of loss, but the reason you sacrifice fundamentally is to gain something higher. That's, that's the sacrificial motif. You give up something that's, that's attractive in the present, but, but the purpose of the sacrifice is, is, to, is, to, is to organize things more effectively at a higher level of being. So, and that is a... Now, you're going to hear a lot in this about levels of being. I think in some ways, all of this levels of being are sort of are attempts to attempts to translate. And, and this is what Russell Brand is going to ask. And after they get Russell off the line, Peterson makes the observation. I think he's dead right. Russell's a very smart guy. He's unfortunately had to gain a lot of the wisdom himself at a very high cost to himself and others, I'm sure. But he's a very smart guy because the questions he asks here, and I I saw this video down, I thought, yeah, I want to watch it at some point. And then as usually happens, I start getting, I start reading comments and getting messages from you who are saying, you got to watch the Russell Brand conversation. There's He asks a lot of good questions. And so often in terms of the videos that I decide to do commentary on, I listen to you because y'all are sorting them for me because I don't necessarily have time to listen to them all. And this is, this is how a lot of these things happened. But this idea of sacrifice is, is critical here. Okay. Levels of being, that's where we were. Levels of being. Well, in, in older church days, we would talk in much less abstract language about these levels of being. And I think in, in some ways now levels of being sort of function as circumlocutions. Why? Because in a secular society, we don't want to talk about the age to come. We don't want to talk about heavenly things. We don't want to use all of this religious language. And so what we've sort of done is taken a whole bunch of philosophical language and inserted it. But if you were to pause them and say, well, tell me of these other levels of beings that are being that aren't physical. Okay, there's the psychological. Okay. And and you've sort of leveled that up from the physical term, haven't you? Yeah, well. And and what you find is all of this circumlocution to, to talk about what would have been talked about in theological language in centuries past. And I think there's a lot of that going on in this video. That is maturation. That That's the forestalling of immediate pleasure for medium to long-term um, well-being and and of course, in terms of Jordan's project, which is part and parcel of the secular project, which is an attempt to somehow ground all of, you don't want to lose all of this, all of this achievement by past generations, culturally, morally, ethically, in terms of wisdom and practice. But what has tended to happen in modernity is there, okay, we want to keep this, so let's just kind of keep it all up in the air while we try to construct um, supports for it upon physicalism. And, and in many ways, that's been the project of the last two centuries. And I've seen that project in theology. I've seen it in philosophy. And in some ways, psychology and biology are just catching up with it because there's the sense of under the threat of postmodernity and other threats, we'll just take all this stuff down and rebuild. And the West, in a sense, said, well, we watched the communists try to do that, and it was a complete failure. We've watched, we've watched others try to do that, and it's a complete failure. So in other words, we sort of want to keep the elements of of Western Christianity up where they are, up in place, but we have to quick fabricate 
little towers of Babel and little little supports for them underneath so that we can keep them there. And in some ways, the entire Jordan Peterson project is exactly this. And, and he's just done it better than others. And he's also been a little bit more forthright to say, well, that stuff up there goes even higher and I can't get there from below and I'm not quite ready to make that jump. Maybe for more than you as well. Hmm. Okay. Um. I have a question, even though I know it's not my podcast. And I... I really do like Russell Brand in these things. I, you know, I, Twitter serves up other things from him and other videos, and I haven't really watched him in almost anything else except the stuff he's done with Jordan and now Jordan and Michaela. But uh, he's a sharp guy. When you transduce a metaphysical idea, transduce. I, I, it makes me think of traducir in Spanish. Um, which is to translate. And I think translate might have been a better word, but trans do sounds a little bit more spiritual. Like sacrifice and sacrifices as an evocation of a greater power further down the line. And you transduce it into materialist and rational, rationalist terms, perhaps to make it more relevant. See, and he's pointing to exactly what I just described. We're going to try and keep all these things up in the air but we're going to now have to get supports for them, justifications for them from below in order to keep them up there. To a, a, a cultural group that don't think in that way anymore. Do you think that we risk missing part, an essential part of the mystery, that much of the devotional life by its nature doesn't have a, a direct uh, translation in secularism, i.e., of course, yes, you know, I've heard you say before, Jordan, that it's as if there were a father that's a stern father that's going to guide you and discipline you and chide you into being a stronger man or woman. But like, uh, um, but I feel too that there is something that what that through sacrifice we are also acknowledging that on this plane of being, on this more of this, more of this, you know, that's post Heidegger, of course, but. There's circumlocutions. You can't talk about, you can't use the kind of language that Lewis points out in his book Miracles, that the language that, let's say, the New Testament is written in, where you have a decorated chair and a sky palace and all of these things. Now we're using all these levels of being and those kinds of words. But but what 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 Brand is really asking is, might it be the case that these things aren't somehow supported by invisible pillars from below that we are trying to sort of bring into view by coloring, but instead they are hung from above? So in some ways, Brand is right there in the middle of the Peugeot Verveke conversation about emanation versus emergence. This plane of being, all our needs cannot be met. In fact, Really, all we can do is generate need. And by sort of being, through sacrifice, we are also acknowledging that on this plane of being, on this plane of being, all our needs cannot be met. In fact, really, all we can do is generate need. And by sort of sacrificing food or sacrificing, like sacrificing something important, we reaffirm our connection to the sublime. Okay, well, I, I think that's an astounding observation that he makes and in some ways what he's doing is rearticulating the argument from the same argument that C.S. Lewis uses in mere Christianity that we seem to be made for another world so is it perhaps not the case that all of this stuff that we see up there in the air that by virtue of our 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 wars in the 20th century that we said all of those elements are critically important that they stay there and instead of trying to find the supports from below and retrace the the physicalism from below that that perhaps they are being actually suspended from above for our good and that in fact in the end we are to follow them up because our desires point to a world that is not this one. Well, I think that whenever you bring a transcendent concept in some sense down to earth, you risk 
inappropriately constraining it if you assume that your act of bringing it down to earth has explained it fully. So and, and so Peterson, and this is this is what Peterson does all the time. He always says, "Okay, we're building it up from below, but I'm always leaving the footnote that it might also come down from above, and it might go further than from below we can see." And he he's, he always gives himself that opening. He has ever since I started listening to him. He he won't. He won't cut off the top, and which is, of course, what irks the likes of Sam Harris about him and merely bothers Brett Weinstein, who sort of is, is more skeptical about above, but not ready to go as far as Sam Harris. I don't believe that my explanation of sacrifice explains it fully, and so I think you can retain that. You can retain the ineffable you can retain the advantages of ineffability. For example, if, if I assess a piece of literature or a film for, and make its metaphysical presumptions more explicit, I don't believe that that necessarily takes away from the film. It, it can, because it can be reductionistic, but it can add an additional, by furthering understanding, it can add an additional layer of, of utility to the to the experience. I've tried to do that with the biblical lectures I've done, for example. I'm not trying to explain everything away, although I do think that, generally speaking, you should use the simplest explanation that's at hand. So it's a risk, but but hopefully it can be a, a risk that is fundamentally productive. Yeah, I reckon that. I suppose, I suppose that mentorship and education is dependent on crossing this space between the ineffable and the at least palpable or the apprehendable to, to, to well, some that's degree. The thing. And, and I think that's a critical point, point that Brand makes right there. Because, okay, so what, what, why do I, as a Christian minister who has been trained by the church, who has experience in the church, and I get this, I get questions from lots of different sides about questions and complaints. Why pay attention to Jordan Peterson? Well, what has Gavin Ashenden asked this question? Okay, what is what has Jordan Peterson done that I haven't been able to do? And 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 Ashenden and I'm probably going to have a conversation with him. Um, can't probably won't come. His schedule's filling up. I'm I'm terribly sorry. I haven't had as many Randall's conversations as I would like. I'm simply bombarded with requests for conversations and podcasts and. I really have to sort some of this out to a degree be, and, and find better rules of knowing when to say yes and when to say no, because I don't like saying no to people. I would rather say yes to everyone, but that, that sometimes just can't be done. And, and that, you know, it's, just, it's a, this is a small channel and I'm a small church pastor and, you know, all those things. Anyway, I'm, Part of what Jordan Peterson is doing is my belief is that the universe is a whole, that we don't really have to choose between what is hung and what comes from below because the God of redemption is the God of creation. And that gets super complicated in terms of the history of thought and Christianity and I by no means have all of those details worked out. But but Brand, as sort of a post-radical Reformation spiritualist, really wants to come from above, but yet appreciates Peterson from below because the dominant culture is so much from below, and Peterson doesn't want to exclude that which is from above. So there, there's a lot going on here thing is that if the ineffable stays entirely ineffable, then you can't put it to use. And that's where Peterson really is strong and helpful, that as a pastor, that's always what I'm dealing with, taking the ineffable and trying to communicate it and trying to apply it. 
and trying to apply it to real people and for their lives and with real questions. And those questions keep changing and they, they always keep changing. And so again, reading uh, Reformation's Carlos Erie's book, that's a history of change, and many of the the ethical and moral questions we face today are are difficult questions to change. And and part of where I differ from, let's say, traditionalists of many stripes is that I think even traditionalists have changed dramatically, and I think that is actually revealed by reading history. And part of that has to do with the transformations that have taken place via the Radical Reformation. Because when I read those, I say, okay, I've got, you know, some of some of Luther's ideas there in me. Some of the Swiss reformers' ideas, well, obviously, as a Calvinist, a lot of them are in me. But a lot of the Anabaptist tradition got into Dutch Calvinism as well, because the the Dutch... And, uh, you know, the Dutch um, Radical Reformation was one of the more potent places in Europe. I mean, Switzerland and the Netherlands were two places where, because of the political system, there was a degree of toleration, and a bunch of these other groups were able to flourish. And that also meant that, for example, North America then became an outlet for some of them as well. And so that's where some of this history ties in with some of these elements. I've got I've got my own time crunch here, and so I'll probably only do part one and post it. And I hope I can get back and, and deal with the second part because I'm going to basically stop when Michaela comes back into the conversation. And then there's some more interchining. And then there's another segment, which is very much connected with this one, but that might have to come into another video. And I think you're absolutely right that the mentorship does that because and there's a profound religious instinct there, and I think it was really operating in you. You you make reference to it a number of times. For example, you had, by your own admission, a strong tendency to um, romanticize the women in your in your life. You say you deify them in some sense, or maybe more accurately, you perceive them that way to begin with, and then over time in some sense, the stars fall away from your eyes, but that's the action of an instinct. That would be the anima projection from a Jungian perspective, is that there's a, an instinct in you that's pushing you towards development, and the way it manifests itself is by illuminating certain elements of your experience, and those might be, that might occur, for example, when you meet a man. Now, there's a, I got a fair number of con con questions after the Peugeot conversation with Peterson, when Jonathan kept talking about attention creating reality. Now, Peterson is using the this element of Jungian psychology, which my friend James has explained to me a number of times and which I still probably don't comprehend sufficiently, and some of you will write it in the YouTube comments, which is fine, and so maybe at some point I'll learn. I'm not as, I'm not as smart as Russell Brand or Jordan Peterson or maybe even not as smart as Michaela Peterson. But for those of us who aren't necessarily that high in IQ, we have to make up for it in effort. And there are other pleasures and rewards in that. But there's, and, and I like where Jordan is going to go with this now, that this, this attention, this, this power of attention, um, and then mentorship, we get drawn into someone. And he's eventually going to go there with respect to Christ. Male figure who you admire who you then start to imitate. It's, it's it, the deep workings of your unconscious illuminate that figure and make him, say, stand out against the background because you've apprehended that there's something about his pattern of being that addresses a lack in yours. And the same thing can happen in romantic relationships, and, and that can also not be purely illusory. You know, in some sense, when you, when you have a romantic relationship with someone, you are chasing the divine in each other. Now, you, both of you... I, I think these are tremendously powerful, insightful points that Peterson is making. And again, that gets into sort of the from below and from above. That, you know, any, any Christian will honor your father and your mother. Any Christian will acknowledge that God instructs us in, in, in knowledge of him through our parents. And 
Peterson is basically building on that in terms of we're learning from our mentors. We're learning from those that that we are attracted to romantically. There's a whole school. I, see, I read all this stuff a number of years ago, but there's a whole school that basically says you will be attracted romantically to a partner, basically to the person who will help you address your unfinished business of, let's say, your parents' relationship or something like that. I, I mean, what Peterson is developing here is, is something akin to that. may fall short, and the relationship may fall apart, but by seeing the divine in the person that you fall in love with, you also invite them to manifest that. And by opening the door to that, they're actually more likely to manifest it. It's a very complex, it's very complex and sophisticated instinct. Incredibly I have complex. Been... And, and it's true. I, I, I see this played out in myself. I see it played out in others. Again, as a pastor, you get a chance to watch people and sort of like a therapist, but, but as a pastor, it's a little bit different. You see them... And again, if you're a careful observer, you see them in a much more well-rounded thing. You see them interact in the wild, whereas if you're a therapist, you're in this little box. And, and in that little box, you hear, you hear stories of the world out there, but as a pastor, you're watching them. It, it's, it's sort of the difference of, of taking an animal out of the wild and putting them in a box and studying them. That's what science does, but... As a pastor, you go into the wild and you live amongst the animals and you are one of the animals. I understand this. I understand this. I have experienced this. I recognize that I have spent a lot of time project through my inability to comprehend my own psychic energies. I've projected onto another. And again, psychic energies don't get too thrown off by by Russell Brand's lingo. You can translate these things into religious terminology if you want to into other terminologies and again the translations are never perfect and they are laden with lots of other things but um don't it's easy it's easy to simply dismiss because he's using kind of new agey language but if you listen to him carefully you ought not to dismiss it because you can track it with other terminology too resources that were available perhaps through tutelage within myself one of the mentors that i write about in that book who like has been incredibly valuable in my life when we first met like by you know synchronicity or chance gave me a copy of the robert johnson's book on gold and inner gold which is a sort of an essay on mentorship and having you know holding one another's gold um and i think yes that how mentorship has functioned in my life has I've gained a great deal of perspective. I've understood that they are kind of uh, psychic uh, uh, synecdoches, holding for me a space, holding meaning. I recognise the fallibility of these people that I uh, like adore or aspire to, um, but in my psyche, they function as coordinates. I was just talking to a brilliant therapist today in therapy <laughs> and like a, and he said that you know that, that you don't need to overcome your father and mother in the physical world with them you need to overcome the imprint of them in your psyche and i said yes in a and this is getting into mapping there was someone on twitter that sent me some uh, three little things that he had written which i thought were quite profound about god and metaphor and trying to put it together they were they were He's basically making an atheist argument, but I might bring them onto the channel and read them, or at least parts of them, because one of the things that we're always doing is mapping, and I've been thinking about this. I, I intend to. There's there's a, an older pastor in the Christian Reformed Church, quite a prominent pastor, who is um, much more sort of in the modernist camp and the modernism camp and probably the mainline camp of the CRC. And a lot of the, and Vin Donk's going to be in that conversation too, but a lot of the, the questions that are going on with respect to, that, that are underneath the, the, the current fightings today have to do, okay, which mappings and how? And, and this is this is what I started getting into a little bit, and I didn't get too far in my in that chapter, but but he's getting into mappings, and so, well, symbolism is a means by which you can map one thing onto another. 
But that, that sort of mapping that we do that they're talking about here seems to be absolutely essential for working any kind of understanding of the world, creating mental models and maps and working with those maps as again as peterson says you do this so your ideas can die so that you don't have to and and that's this whole process of cognition representation using metaphor to try to understand again assuming via christianity which is is an, a point that we brought up quite a bit earlier in the videos that that the world is a stable place and so it isn't the case that everything is simply chaos the world is a stable place and and if there's stability in the world then then stable maps can be created and stable models can be created and we can then work from these stable models productively in the world to seek our own goals and to and to and to live in this world in a fruitful productive way since they are hollowed out carapaces in reality. I don't mean that father and mother in the physical world with them. You need to overcome the imprint of them in your psyche. And I said, yes, in a sense, they are hollowed out carapaces in reality. I don't and, and the imprint of them in the psyche, this gets into what I've often talked about in terms of the first draft, that as human beings, we grow up and the first draft of a marriage is the marriage of your parents. The first draft of a romance is the romance of your parents. The first draft of parenting is how your parents have parented you. Now, additional drafts come on board and we sort of hold other drafts out there. Sometimes we incorporate things in our draft. Sometimes things are incorporated and we don't know that. A lot of this we're doing projection. I mean, it's enormously complicated what we're doing, but that's sort of the point that he's making with respect to his therapist. And that's exactly the kind of work that therapists and therapy does. I mean, that father and mother in the physical world with them, you need to overcome the imprint of them in your psyche. And I said, yes, in a sense, they are hollowed out carapaces in reality. I don't mean that with any disrespect to my actual mother and father, but like the, the, the mother and father that I deal with live in my psychic landscape. They don't live in Essex, England, you know. Um, so like uh, I recognize, yes, that we can use relationship as an external coordinate to activate dormant psychic energies. So there's a kind of reductionism in that too, in some sense, right? Because by, by, by doing that, you reduce the, the, the experience of the divine in someone else to activation of an unconscious um, uh, complex, let's say. But one of the things you point out in the book, and, and it's possible to go deeper than this too. One of the things you point out in the book is that when you allow or ask or invite someone to be your mentor, you also allow them to manifest that element of them that's most mentor-like. And they can do that independently to some degree of their other flaws. Just like when you're a parent, a father, you can act paternally as a figure of authority, even though you are by no means a perfect figure of authority. The child still needs you to be the best authority figure that you can be, despite your flaws, and, and you will manifest that. But it... And that's a critical point right now, especially at this time where when you go and look for flaws, you will find them. There's a Calvinist axiom. It, that's also not false because the ideal that we're all chasing, we, we don't know what its ultimate reality is. You know, if you have an instinct towards further development, let's say, what that means is that there's something about you that could be greater than it currently is. And we don't know the limits to what that currently greater could be. And that's where the, the idea of mentorship, let's say, shades into something like religious worship, because I suppose if you think about the Christian world, the ultimate mentor is Christ. And you could say... And I love that move that he made right there, because... Be behind the backdrop of, you know, we've been talking about platforms again. I talked about that a little bit at the beginning of this. Well, the platform is publishing and the, the arena is the individual and the agent is you and the book and you are responsible for doing all of this. What happens in Christianity and in a religion is that the arena is a community 
and the mentor is Christ. And he is being presented to you not only in a book, not only directly, but presented to you within a community. And he has now inhabited the norms and even even what isn't obviously directly connected to him, you are ensconced in, in Pauline terms in the New Testament, you are ensconced in the body of Christ. And that shift is important because the individualism of of a book about mentors and an individual who wants to do self-improvement, you sort of place yourself in the, the um, meta-divine realm. But in Christ, you're ensconced in the, in the agentic and the, the arenic Christ. Say that being a Christian, or you could say that being a psychologist, and if you said it being a psychologist, if you think about the Christian world, the ultimate mentor is Christ. And you could say that being a Christian, or you could say that being a psychologist, and if you said it being a psychologist, you would say, well, it's by definition that the ultimate mentor is Christ. And what Christianity has been as it unfolds itself over the last 2000 years is an attempt to engage all of the people within that belief system in a dialogue about what that ideal actually constitutes. You know, and there's tradition that feeds into that, the biblical stories and, and the corpus of tradition that goes along with that. But all of it is a collective attempt to specify that ideal so that people can use it as a target to further their development. And that's not delusional. That, that furthering of development is unbelievably useful practically. Yes, yes. And forgive me because I have a, a response question once again, and I want to ensure that Michaela, who surely has had a lifetime of tolerating this kind of business, her father citing Jung at passers by. Um, like I would like to I would like to say, when Edinger in his analysis of William William Blake's uh, engravings from the book of Job says, um, like of the passage where Yahweh shows the behemoth and the Leviathan to Job and says, look upon the Leviathan and the behemoth that I have made as I made thee. Edinger in his analysis says that Yahweh is saying to Job here that, that it, all potentiality is held in Yahweh. It is beyond good and evil. How does this transition between an Old Testament version of God that requires of us to become good, that God itself or himself or herself is also good? How does this idea, this interpretation of our relationship with God, this Old Testament, which uh, places this sort of obligation that sort of it punishes Job for his uh, fatic uh, impersonation of worship, how does that evolve into the Christian idea of uh, Christ as the perfect mentor, Christ as well, the perfect... He, he asks a blatantly theological question via Carl Jung and Jung's address of Job. I, I'm not going to get too far into this because I have not gotten far enough into Jung or answers to Job. But here you have, in a sense, a question of, he, he's just asked, blatantly asked him a question of biblical interpretation. It's an astounding thing in an interview like this. Why emblem. don't you ask a difficult question? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Well, you know, Jung talked. And then he says, Jesus about this a fair bit in answer to Job, and that's a very difficult book to summarize, and it's also a very terrifying book, but the upshot of it is... Peterson had his terrifying books by Jung. Essentially something like this, which is that whatever God is, the, the best element of him can plausibly be brought forth as a consequence of the manifestation of what's best in us. And that might be the willingness to sacrifice and the willingness to trust and the and the, the the courage to love your neighbor, the courage to love your enemy. Peterson is bringing a lot of Jesus in there, and I think that's right. I've been so I preached on Luke 15, which is the parable of the prodigal son, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost coin, 
recently, and I brought a fair amount of Job into that sermon, because I think there is a lot going on with Jesus. I think if you want to know the answer to Job, it's Jesus. I don't know. I don't know if the Jungians are going to like that, but I think Jesus is the answer to Job. Me, and, and, and this is a profound question. It's like, would reality shine a more benevolent face upon us if we were all as good as we could be? And that's the Christian idea. And I've been dealing with this directly in a number of those sermons because the the question that. The people ask, people implicitly bring forward a question. If you've walked through my rough drafts or you go back into my rough drafts, you can see me address this question directly because the assumption is if I do everything perfect in this world, will I get what Job got before the, the, the trading places bet with Satan? Okay. If, the question underneath is, is this world merely governed by karma? And the answer of the book of Job is no. Because Job's friends are emphatic. Job, you've sinned. And the book of Job is emphatic. Job says whether it's religious scrupulosity or social justice, I am above blame, yet God has attacked me. You get to Christ, and in a sense, Christianity doubles down on this and asserts that, in fact, if, in fact, you do what's right completely, they will hate you like they hated me. Well, who's they? Well, people. Why? Because there's something in us that, See, in Job, the calamities that befall him, whereas some of them are mediated by people, but not the whirlwind, you know, not the what takes his seven daughters and three sons. Now, these raiders come and take them, but the raiders are, are, are just depersonified raiders. And so Job is very karmic. But in the story of Jesus, it's people. Because people, people are the source of the problem. And so then the the question gets the question gets moved from an impersonal meta divine realm where well is the world is just some great machine and if I do everything that's right then everything good will come to me. It gets to the New Testament and Jesus does what's right and he has mastery over the physical elements, mastery over nature. He can still a storm. He can raise the dead. He can multiply loaves and fishes. He can do all of these things. And he, in fact, knows by virtue of his 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 temptation with the devil that he, he ought not to, and he will not use these things for his own personal or political advantage. The chief problem is people, and then and that that doubles down on the question of Job: Can the human heart be saved? In other words, in, in Job, the world is sort of just this impersonal thing out there. But by the time you get to Jesus, the world is us. We are the cause of the problem. And I, I can't see that that idea is wrong. Now, and, and would reality shine a more benevolent face upon us if we were all as good as we could be? And that's the Christian idea. And I, I can't see that that idea is wrong. And, and see, I think, see, this gets, now you get to your levels of being. And obviously, the resurrection is the answer to the puzzle of Job. Because Jesus, in the resurrection, says, finally, ultimately, ultimately at levels of being, there will be justice. There will be righteousness. And you know, in terms of the video that I'm thinking about doing, the the clock speed of Jesus is just so radically different than from Job, because Job is looking for this all to be mediated within his own little life. With Jesus, now we've got levels of being that go off into other places. 
And that's how the equations get resolved. Now, and, and I think well, certainly Jung interpreted the story of Job in that light. And he believed that Job sort of set God back on his heels, so to speak, by, by being a more moral agent in some sense than God himself was. But underneath all that was this notion that if you acted as if God was love, if you believe that, and that would be manifest in your perceptions and your actions, that that would invite the deity of love into existence. Again, the difficulty with Jesus is, here you have someone who is doing this, and it's precisely, at least with the Pharisees, it's precisely the, the, the degree to which he's extending love to the tax collectors and the prostitutes that, that he is going to be killed. And that's true. You know that. You know that when you when you when you interact with people with love, and and there's a tremendous courage in that. It makes the world a better place, and we don't know how deep that reaches. You know, it certainly reaches as deep as humanity itself. But and is there something transcendently real about it beyond that? Uh, who knows? See, and I think this is where Peterson is wrong here because I don't think Jesus loses his culture war. Jerusalem will be destroyed. The Romans will build ramparts. So many quotes from Jesus in the Lucan passages that I've been reading are quotes from the from the Psalms. The babies will be dashed against the rock, the babies of Jerusalem. Why? Did Jesus love them inadequately? Did Jesus love them insufficiently? Well, the, the point is that via the cross, he loved them fully, but the clock speed is more than the span of one human life. And I, I don't see Peterson engaging with this at that question, at that level. Who knows? It's, <laughs> that's, that's a far enough target for, for anyone, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. That's a hell of a question, Russell. Yeah, I'm just sitting here, just like, yep, I'll just... That was... Whew. All right, and I'm going to close it there. I'm at 28.02 because they're going to have a little bit of banter and it's going to be lighter for a little while. Then they're going to go back into it and it's going to be good and deep again. So, but that's enough for this video because I'm out of time. And so there'll be a part two to this. Uh, so yeah, look for it. Hopefully I'll have time to do it this week because if I don't have time to do it this week, I might forget. And there might never be a part two. And if I were more conscientious or sufficiently embarrassed by uh, all of my unfinished products, maybe you'd see more finished products, but fewer new started ones. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. So anyway, I'll leave a comment. Thanks for watching. Thank thank you those. I don't, I don't say thank you enough to those who support on Patreon um, or who endure the ads since I monetized or who support Livingstone's Church. So thanks for doing this.